Well, thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you are here tonight. Father, we just thank you for your presence here. We, I know these people, as well as myself, Lord God, we are just looking for um, your order. Uh, things are chaotic, uh, uncertain. We just ask you to give us guidance and direction. And we call forth the order of God even now in our own minds and our own lives. And Lord, we just thank you for your word and your spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to teach this correctly tonight, I pray in the name of Jesus. And I give you praise for it. Amen and amen. So tonight, very pragmatic, straightforward teaching. I'm going to teach about uh, justified and righteous, justified and righteous. I've been dealing with this a little bit in different meetings, and I want to go a little bit farther into tonight, these particular aspects of it. And so here's the preamble of the teaching, uh, justified and righteous. When a person in faith, believing, accepts Jesus as Savior, at that exact moment, myriad supernatural occurrences ensue, which instantly and forever change the human condition. For instance, salvation from sin, eternal life and no death, regeneration of the human spirit, justification, which means the right order of God, righteousness, which is the right function within the right order of God. Also, we become citizens of heaven, and the governmental order of God is now our new dominion, and we give praise to God for that. So these new creation in Christ realities are comprehensive, and they are continually in effect. And I really want to emphasize that tonight, because there is no inconsistency with the consistent and constant things of God. They don't vary, they don't deviate, we do, we think differently, but what God has done for us is a set-in-place, permanent reality. And so that's really one of the main emphasis tonight is that. And so that's the preamble of the teaching. The introduction of the teaching is this, justified and righteous. Justification, as I've already explained a few times, is really the fundamental form. Justification is the fundamental form of good and right. It's the form of it. And this is based upon divine judicial decisions that God has made establishing the legal standard of order. He establishes the legal standard of order based upon divine law, based upon his word, his law. So again, justification is the fundamental form of good and right from God's perspective. Righteousness is faith functional, meaning that the manifestation of the divine law and order of God is activated by faith. So we realize that good and right is operational. You can cause it to function. It's established the parameters thereof, and you can operate within those parameters, but you cause that function by faith. You believe that righteousness is a real uh, source of change in your life, and you begin to operate from that particular perspective. So let's deal with another little portion of this. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 6, God was addressing Abram, promising him this tremendous blessing. You remember the story. As a comparative, God took him outside and said, look at the heavens and all the stars that you see there. If you could number those stars, then you've been able to calculate the blessing that I'm going to place in your life. And so with that kind of a comparative it really gave uh, Abram something to uh, aspire to. God said that, so I'm going to try to take advantage of as much of that as I can. And so when God said that to Abram in verse number 6, then it says, Abram believed in the Lord. So when God promised him that, at that moment, Abram just heard words, but he decided these words sound so pure and true to me, plus it's very positive and inspirational, I believe, I choose to believe what God just told me, which was totally contrary to what his life had been up to that point, basically. It's much more extravagant, larger, going to be way different. And, but he said, I just choose to believe it because God said it. Now, in that in itself, that's a good point to ponder. When God tells you something and you know it's God, 
The best thing to do is say, I believe. I believe. And so uh, then he believed in the Lord when God said that. And he goes on to say, and he, and that's a capital H there. So then he, God, reckoned it to him as righteousness. So let's go into the new covenant now in Romans chapter 4 and cover this same scenario as is presented to us in the book of Romans. In chapter 4 of Romans, it says in verse 13, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world. Stop, uh, let, full stop. Think about that for a moment. God was saying, I'm promising you the world. That, that's elaborate. That's, that's a magnitude of promise that encompasses our world. And so uh, those that are going to become the heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Righteousness is faith functional. Righteousness works when you activate faith. We'll get into that a little bit tonight. So that's what that says in verse 13. Dropping down in this narrative to verse number 20, it says, Yet with the respect to the promise of God, he, Abram, did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now that's a pragmatic word of instruction, really, because that's the most difficult thing that we seem to have to contend with is when it hasn't happened yet, what am I going to do? Am I going to keep praising him and thanking him? Or am, I, or am I going to give up in the process and say it's all just a bunch of bunk anyway? So he, he says here that he, in respect to the promise, it hadn't happened yet, so that hasn't changed. But as far as the promise was concerned, he was willing to focus on that and not waver in unbelief. He didn't allow himself to stop believing the possibility, the possibility that God had offered to him. And so it says he grew strong in faith. So there was a growth process where evidently it says here, his faith became even stronger when it wasn't happening. Wait a minute. So his faith grew stronger in the process. That's astonishing. And it goes on to say in this word, because of that, he was giving glory to God. Thank you, God, for increasing my faith. My, my strength is getting more. Thank you. So I give glory to you. That wouldn't be happening if it weren't for you, Father. So I glorify you. And it goes on to say in the next verse, and being fully assured. So he was totally convinced, fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So he said, if God said it, He's obligated himself to his word. He will do it. And he continued to believe exactly that way. Then we get to what we read back there in Genesis chapter 15. Therefore also, in addition to all of that that I've just said to you, it was reckoned to him by God as righteousness. So faith, righteousness by faith is functional by believing God. When you believe God, the function of righteousness begins to bring influence and effect. And I think this is important to uh, ponder tonight because we've heard these words many, many times. It was reckoned to him by God or imputed to him by God. So what do those words really mean? It means that when God heard Abram's response, it says that God assumed and assigned a characteristic to him and activated the effect of that characteristic. What happened was interwoven into God's thought process. That's now a fact. When he imputed it to Abram as righteousness, as far as God is concerned, he's righteous. And that was interwoven into the thought process of God now, never to change because of the response of Abram. So when we see that uh, reckoned or imputed means to assume and assign a characteristic and then activating the effect of that characteristic, this is important. We're talking about faith here, righteousness, righteousness by faith. And so this is what the word says. So in the mind of God, he saw Abram is righteous. And that's a permanent perception that God never changed his mind about either. Was Abram perfect? No. Did he make mistakes? Yes. But God always considered him because now it's interwoven into God's thought process, 
Abram is a righteous man. And I want you to begin to juxtapose that next to you and your life. And because I'm going to read some more scripture here and make this application. It says in the next verse, of verse number 23, now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned as a believer, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse 25 says, He who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. We were the ones out of order. We were out of the order of God. So to bring us back into the parameters of the order of God, justification was necessary. And to uh, uh, achieve that justification, we understand that Jesus, his, his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension was for our justification. He came, he lived, he died, he rose from the dead, he ascended into the heavenlies for our justification. It says so right there. It was for, because he did all of that, God raised him from the dead because of the fact we needed to come back into order. And so that's very important, I think, from my standpoint, that we need to understand this is very important that God did all of this for us in order to set us back into proper order. And so uh, God, is, God in his grace, he's so wonderful. Uh, he loves us, agape love, which means he's very th philanthropic. He loves to generously give to us. And so he gave his son and gave us salvation and all the rest of those attendant benefits that come with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in God's mind, we are righteous. Now, it's not because of us that we're righteous, but it's because of God. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, but by his doing, by God's doing, you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Uh, God sees us as righteous through the prism of Jesus Christ. We are righteous in him. We are one in him. Whatever he is, whatever he stands for, his characteristics, uh, we are him, we are in him. And that's where God sees us in that positional reality of being in, in Christ Therefore, righteousness, that characteristic, is activated on our behalf. And we prove that through faith, righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. We live righteous by faith. Amen. Now, okay, now, the, the third page of my notes here. Well, I'm flying through this. That's okay, right? Third page says application. So application of justified and righteous. All right, here's what I'm going to say. And I think this is important. If you want application of what I'm teaching, first thing that we must do is evacuate all religious legalistic mindset. Otherwise, you ain't going to get it. So all of the teaching we've had, not it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't lined up with the fullness. And so uh, any kind of legalistic uh, religious mindset You've got to clear that out, evacuate it, eliminate it, get rid of it, and then open yourself up to what God says. Because he says in his Bible that he gave us, in his word, in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. That's past tense. That's your current status. You are saved, period. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. So the evidence of that is through faith, through believing it. And it goes on to say in that verse, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, the gift of faith. He gave us that endowment, that uh, portion, allotment of faith that we might believe in Jesus Christ. And upon doing that, believe that we're saved. Sometimes fundamental reality needs to be uh, reviewed and say, uh, I'm saved, therefore I already live forever. I don't have to seek a way to have immortality. I've got it. Uh, all these uh, 
transhumanists that are out there trying to put together technology and biology and look for a way to be living forever. They're wasting their time because the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God alone possesses immortality. So they're wasting their time. They're wasting their time. However, they're not going to stop, but that's fine. But here it says, by grace you are saved by faith. So I want to go through this next part, maybe a little bit more methodically, in Romans chapter 3, just so we understand this. We're not speaking out of both sides of our mouth at once. It's just that God has covered all these things. In Romans 3, and it says in verse number 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that's a true statement. The next verse says, being justified, that's the rest of the story. Being justified, put back in order as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom we are also in. So we're in the environment who have been inducted into Christ Jesus and the redemption that is there, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. So it was an appeasement sufficient to God to allow concessions to be made and granted when it comes to sin and failing God and disobedience. So the concessions were made because of Jesus being the propitiation, which allowed expiation and justification. So he was the, he was the, 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 uh, uh, what was needed, his blood, and that produced the removing of sin from us, and then justification sets in, and we're back in order. All right? It's a process. And then it goes on to say in this scripture, he made him uh, publicly as a propitiation in his blood, through faith, through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. God was demonstrating, I'm righteous. I want people to really understand this. God is love. God is life. God is light. But God's operational capacity is from the perspective of righteousness. I am righteous. That's how I operate. I love you because I'm righteous. I heal you because I'm righteous. And so this is important to understand here. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over, passed over the sins previously committed now the propitiation has been offered for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God is righteous, he is just, and he is the justifier. He's the one that puts us in proper order in Jesus Christ, eligible for the benefits of being righteous in the sight of God, right standing before God from God's perspective. This is uh, some important, in my estimation, phrases that I'm going to throw out here tonight relative to this because I think maybe this would help someone who may see this in the future or someone who even might be here tonight to stop shortchanging ourselves because we think we're not worthy we haven't lived up to the requirements, and so that's why things aren't going the way they should. That's not the case. And so I want to deal with that just a little bit in First John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And it says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he, that's God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the phraseology there is that is a continuous covering. It is a continuous cleansing. It is a, uh, uh, a, it's, it's predicated upon, but it's predicated upon how we deal with verses 8 and 10. Because verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10 says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So it's predicated upon honest confession. I was a sinner. Yes, I was. But now 
I am righteous because God has forgiven me of my trespasses. He's cleansed me from all of my sins. And that's an ongoing process. And no matter how religious we are, no matter how many rules and regulations we try to keep, we're still going to mess up. But thank God it's an ongoing process where we are righteous in the eyes of God because he has cleansed us a continuous process of what we have done, what we're doing wrong today, what we'll do wrong in the future. If we're not on purpose sinning, just to be in God's grill, then we're understanding this influence is going to be effective every single day of our life, no matter what we think about it. It only matters what God thinks about it. And in his mind, it's already interwoven in his thought life. We are righteous. The Bible says one place, I don't remember your sins. So anyway, 1 John 3 Verse 7 says, Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as God is righteous. Same comparative. So as long as we're practicing, and that's a pretty good word right there, we're still learning how to do it right. We're becoming practitioners. But as long as you're giving forth the effort to live within the parameters of the established order of God, then God says we're righteous. We're just as righteous as he is. So continue the process. You're doing fine. No matter what your negative thoughts said to you a moment ago, God says you're doing fine. You're going to make it just fine under the glory of God. So this says if you're practicing righteousness, you're righteous as God is righteous. Then in chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 20, it says, in whatever our heart condemns us, and whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart. God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. That's a key. And wh whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So therefore, one of the criterion for successful results from God when we go before him is believe that I'm not condemned. I can have confidence going into his presence. I can go in before him at the throne of grace with boldness, expecting mercy just in time unto the glory of God. So this is a very powerful, powerful word here that says us, uh, uh, these things that we're doing, uh, uh, God will, will answer us as long as, again, we're practicing righteousness, and we have the attitude. Okay, time out. We can say everything. I'm confident in God doing this, that. But what is it in here? How, 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 what's the real truth that's resonating in here? That's the point. So it's in our heart. It's our heart content that establishes our true belief system. Whatever we really believe in here is what we really believe that will come out here in faith and power. Then if you look in 1 John 5. And 1 John 5. Verse 14 says. And this is the confidence. Which we have before God. Before him. That if we ask anything. According to his will. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So it's based upon uh, true confidence. Uh, I've heard preachers say, in fact, I, uh, I'm ashamed of the fact I've said to myself, uh, fake it till you make it. No, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. That's not going to work. Don't fake it till you make it. Get to where you really believe in fact, uh, meditate on the word and believe before you speak. And then we see the result that we want because we have confidence in that. So let's look at the prime example of that in this uh, New Testament portion of the Bible in James chapter 5. And I like the way they make the comparative because they make sure that we understand that we're just talking about uh, another human being on the planet and uh, the experience that, that human being had when it came to prayer uh, and believing God. Because James chapter 5, 
and verse 16, and the last part of that verse says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Then it goes on to say, Elijah was a man, a human being with a nature like ours, and he prayed uh, earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That's a magnificent example of someone who had confidence in what he was asking God to do. But it says the main point there really is he's a human being just like we are, which means if he was capable of doing that, so are we. And when God inspires in us something to pray about, first of all, God told him to do this, and then he obeyed that. But we have to have the same kind of attitude that he did. So the, what, let's look at a couple of these words. The effective prayer. All right, a prayer is a request, a petition. You're going before God, you're asking him something. So it's a respectful uh, request from God. But the word effective, the word effective means literally it will produce the expectation. If your prayer life is effective, it will produce what you expect. That's what that word says. So the uh, prayer that produces your expectation is presented by a righteous person. And that kind of a prayer can accomplish much. And the word accomplish is a powerful word. In fact, it's one of the triune descriptions of the power of God in Ephesians 1.19. Where it gives that triune description of the power of God. Let's look at that real quick. Now, go back to James here, but in Ephesians 1, 19, and it says, What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. So the word power there is dunamis. The word strength is kratos, which means governmental dominion. And that third word, might, is talking about iskus, or the forceful energy to cause change. Well, guess what? This word accomplish is the word isku, which means the forceful energy that produces change. So when a righteous person is praying before God, expecting to produce what he's expecting, he's releasing a prayer to God that has the force of change attached to it. Isku, that which will change the situation. I'm not just wishfully thinking, begging God to please do this, but based upon his word, I'm praying the will and the purpose of God based upon what God said his will is. Therefore, I'm releasing the force of change. Not only the miracle working power, not only the governmental authority of God, but the force of change is coming out of my mouth in the name of Jesus. We had a, an example Sunday morning, which I'm very grateful for, Connie and I both. Uh, we've had God do miracles in our meetings. It's, we've seen that. It's been a while. It's going to come around again. It's going to happen. But Diane Pennington came up for prayer, and, and you know, we were putting stuff away, and, you know, we are a gypsy church trying to get ready to get out of there and go eat lunch at Chick-fil-A or wherever we're going. And, and uh, so anyway, it's hustle and bustle, and, and she's standing there and wants prayer for a shoulder that's bad. And I said, okay, well, so Connie and Ann Anderson, I think it was, and myself, and now I could tell from the expression on Diane Pennington's face, I'm about to get healed. <laughs> And we walked up to her, and we laid our hands on her, and I let loose words of effective prayer. And I mean, a bolt of lightning went through us and about put us all on the floor. I was thankful to God that that's the force of change. And so what I'm trying to describe this tonight for this reason, that's something that God has given us the capacity to exhibit, express, and demonstrate. And it's based upon our true attitude of who we are in God. We're not begging God to use us. He's saying, please let me use you. And so here, this example brings it home very, very clearly, I think, that we are to apply the fact that God considers us righteous. It's reckoned unto us as righteousness. Therefore, with that in, in place, let's look at some scriptures real quick about uh, righteousness, 
benefits, etc. In Psalm 33 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. So when we praise God and sing before God, we're dis- demonstrating and displaying an attribute of a righteous person. We're praising him and, and prayer is becoming. It's, it's, very, it's a favorable thing to do. And, and so let's look at and now in, in Psalm 34 and verse 15. I love this one. It says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. So God is watching us. He has not lost track of me. Sometimes I feel like I can't find God, but he knows where I am. And he says his eyes are toward the righteous person. He's paying specific attention. I always think about the creator of the universe is literally taking time to pay attention to me. That to me, that's big. And then he said, not only that, his ears are open, so he's expecting me to say something to him. Praise him, worship him, ask what I need from him. But he wants us to have this uh, transcendent communication channel open and, and utilized back and forth, back and forth, that God can hear our needs and respond to them. Now, here's another one in Proverbs 29. And uh, verse number two, this is pretty important for the season of governmental disorder that we're enduring right now. It says in Proverbs 29, two, when the righteous increase or when the righteous become great, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. I can relate to that. That's what's going on now. But here it says, when, not if. But when the righteous become great, people rejoice. So I I am a firm believer in a gigantic turnaround. I think it's going to get better. Uh, Ann Anderson asked me about that Sunday morning, and I was telling her, I simply believe. I mean, Jesus could come tomorrow, and I'd be good with that. Come, Jesus, now. But I don't think it's time yet. And so I say, Lord, then since that's the case then let your righteous ones become great so the people can begin to rejoice again, be filled with joy. So that's our willingness to participate in the fact, I believe I'm righteous, so I'm an agent of change. I have the ability to change things in the earth realm under the glory of God. All right, another place, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45. And verse number 8. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit, and righteousness spring up with it. And then God says, I, the Lord, have created it. I've created that kind of a dynamic. I've created that potential. And so it says, uh, rain down, drip down, heavens. And that, what that's really saying is pour down righteousness means we're asking God to pour out All of the heavenly possibility that's available. Everything that's available from heaven, pour it down, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And God says, I'm the one that's created this possibility of this dynamic change. And so praying for this is evidently a good thing to do. Romans 14, 17. Romans 14, 17. I say that on purpose because I'm being clever. No. Romans fourteen, seventeen, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So being practitioners of the kingdom, these should be demonstrated characteristics of the kingdom that we uh, make available every day. We should externalize these things from the internal reality of who we are. We're righteous. We should live righteously. We should be demonstrating peace and joy in the midst of all the chaos and the negative negative words that we're hearing. But we're supposed to be the bastion. We're supposed to be the uh, place of hope and determination. And we're going to continue to be that. And we are demonstrating the kingdom when these attributes are shown forth unto his glory. Jesus said in Matthew 5,
in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6, Jesus said, Blessed are, the, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, I don't know what your definition of satisfaction is, but that means that you're good. That's, hey, I'm, I'm good. I'm satisfied. Uh, and it's the basis of that is I hunger and I thirst for righteousness. And then I receive the totality of satisfaction, spirit, soul, body, finances, emotions, family, ministry, whatever it might be satisfied because righteousness is something that's worth pursuing with a passion unto the glory of God. And that's why Jesus also said in Matthew 6 and verse 9, pray then in this way, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then in verse 31, do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first and continuously his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. That's a very pragmatic word. Straight forward from the mouth of God. And so this is important. We understand this anew and afresh. So we're in this position that we can release the energy that causes change. The kingdom of God can be invited to be imported into the earth realm under the glory of God. And God has promised to meet all of our needs as long as, as long as we're pursuing him, his kingdom and his righteousness. And in Matthew 13 and verse 23, it gives us the next step in what I'm teaching you tonight. And that is we need to begin to uh, bear the fruit of the kingdom. We need to bear the fruit of the kingdom. Matthew 13, verse 23. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil. This is the man who hears the word and understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some 100, some 60, some 30. We're talking about kingdom fruit. It is all encompassing. It's comprehensive. It's righteousness, peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. It's financial increase. It's, it's lands and things. It's people. It's property. It's what God wants you to have in the earth realm. But the important thing is, if we understand this message, and that's what Jesus asked them in Matthew thirteen fifty one, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes. Jesus said, on the basis that you have said, yes, I understand the kingdom teaching, he said to them, therefore, because you understand this, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. So the point of that is, if you really understand the kingdom, then you're going to be a, king, a kingdom fruit producer. You're going to produce the fruit of the kingdom. Important? Yes. Because in Matthew 21... And verse 43, Jesus said these words. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, speaking to a group of people that weren't pursuing righteousness, and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. So God expects us to produce the fruit of the kingdom. He gives us the ability to do that. So just digressing a moment back to Matthew 12, where it says very clearly, about your belief system again in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. You brood of vipers. I love Jesus. He didn't mince words. You crazy bunch of liberal Democrats. Shut up. <laughs> That's what he would have said today. You communist, atheistic, nefarious, you know what? <sighs> he said, that was, thank you, Lord. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart, out of your belief system. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. And I say to you that every careless 
every useless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, there you go, and by your words you shall be condemned. So within the parameters of God's order is based upon our words, our word usage. So that being said, and it needed to be said, so I said it, in Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, if we're going to bring forth fruit and what comes out is what's in us, Philippians 1.11 says, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So we can produce the fruit of righteousness that is contained within us. And uh, I've got three more places to go and then I'll quit. and We can all wipe our brow and have a drink of water. In Psalm 33, Psalm 33, verse 4, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. So God loves that which is right. God loves that which is based upon his judicial decision of divine law and order. He loves that. That's why the earth experiences the loving kindness of the Lord, because of these things. And so we take that thought and go to Hebrews chapter 5, and it says very clearly in Hebrews chapter 5, it's kind of a mild scolding in a way, but in Hebrews 5.11, concerning him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since we have become dull of hearing since you have become dull of hearing. Verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. And watch this key uh, verse here. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Righteousness is the conjunctive of kingdom. If you can't function in righteousness, you're going to be a very poor functionary in kingdom. Then it goes on to say, but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Chapter 6 begins, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to the maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. God is, none of those things are bad, but once you've established those things, there's a deeper level to go to. And that's what God is saying to all of us tonight in the name of the Lord. And I believe that this teaching represents the fact that God wants you to recognize, as far as he's concerned, you're righteous. So begin to function as an operative within the power and the purpose of the righteousness of God. And with that word, I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.